So Craig V. Bourne, 1976, uh, three years later than Fontiero, um, deals with one of my favorite subjects, which is to say beer. Um, this case, however, I want to point out a very important distinction that what they're talking about in non any actuality really isn't uh, beer. The briefs, the opinion, uh, all talk about this non-intoxicating beer um, that was not allowed to be, to be sold to men under the age of 21, but was allowed to be sold to women over the age of 18, providing that gender-based distinction. Uh, the beer in question in, in this case is 3.2% beer. Um, at the time of this case, this was the only beer that was legal in the state of Oklahoma and also the state of Utah. Um, to call 3.2% beer non-intoxicating may be true. It still has alcohol, alcohol and it still has uh, the properties that can get one inebriated. But to also call it beer seems to be a crime against everything good that beer can be. So the distinction in this case is the first time we see a distinction that is beneficial to women. So the distinction in this case um, says that men between the ages of 18 to 21 cannot buy this non-intoxicating beer, but men, but women over the age of 18 actually can. So this provides a distinction of which women are actually the beneficiaries, which would make sense in this case as Craig, um, Curtis Craig is actually a man who's bringing this suit. Um, while Ruth Bader Ginsburg is not the counsel in this case, she was an advisor on behalf of the ACLU and was sitting at counsel's desk during oral arguments and helped articulate a lot of what gets played out um, in this case. So this case is a seven to two decision. Um, meaning that two justices uh, dissent. Justice Brennan, Brennan writes the decision in this case, and this decision is very much a compromise. Um, the Supreme Court says that this law is simply unconstitutional um, based on a new level of judicial scrutiny and that gender classifications must apply what is known as a heightened and intermediate level scrutiny. You will sometimes hear this referred to as heightened scrutiny or intermediate, intermediate scrutiny, both of those two terms are sort of interchangeable in this regard, but understand that it reflects a new type of scrutiny that sits above rational basis, but below strict scrutiny. Um, what this test requires is that a state must demonstrate um, that the distinction served an important governmental interest and is substantially related to achieving those interests. And the court says in this case that, at least with regard to the first part, an important governmental interest was not made in this case. And the reasoning why is quite interesting. The state of Oklahoma argues that their reason for making this distinction was that men had higher rates of drunk driving than women of comparable age. Justice Brennan looking at the facts, realizes that there's, there's a significant problem with the argument that they're making. They argued that men were 11 times more likely to be arrested for DWI than women of the same age. So that's women, men and women between the age of 18 to 20, that men were 11 times more likely to be arrested. But that did not consider what the base rate that they were applying that 11 times to was. Women ages 18 to 20 were only 0.18% likely to be arrested for DWI. If you do 11 times that, it's 2%. Justice Brennan points out that this is not a significant problem and that this distinction on the basis uh, of gender makes absolutely no sense. Since 98% of men and women both similarly situated would not be arrested under this law. Therefore, there's no important governmental objective, even, <clears throat> and even if there were, even if there were, so they fail the first part of their test, there's no important government objective. But even if we did consider that an important governmental objective, precluding all males ages 18 to 21 from purchasing beer was not significantly related to that objective, since 98% of those males we're never going to be in violation of the DWI standard. And so one, it's not an important state objective. And two, it's not substantially related to that objective. 
The court also goes on to note that insofar as Gossert v. Clary may be inconsistent, that decision is disapproved. So it's important to realize that they do not overrule Gossert v. Clary, but they distinguish Craig v. Bourne. Um, so the standard going forward is intermediate scrutiny, but Gossert v. Clary somehow remains good law, though it is distinguished and it diminishes time. Um, remember in the previous case, in Fontiero, Justice Brennan was a justice who pushed for strict scrutiny in gender cases. He is the one that argued that the strict scrutiny standard should apply. Do you think in three years, um, Justice Brennan had changed his mind? Absolutely not. Um, Justice Brennan knew from the previous case that he absolutely could not get a majority with the strict scrutiny standard. And he knew that he could probably get a majority, a, a larger majority um, if he employed a different standard, something that was above rational basis, but not quite strict scrutiny. It's important to note that Justice Brennan perhaps is one of the most strategic justices who have sat in this court. In fact, and often his law clerks will tell a story um, about one of the first things that he told them when they came to serve in his office. And he would ask them the question, what is the most important word on the Supreme Court? To which Justice Brennan would tell them that five was the most important word on the Supreme Court, recognizing that what you wanted to do, what you wanted in your heart to make as law only matters if you can convince four other people to go along with it. And so in this case, it appears that Justice Brennan uh, lowered the standard that he wanted, strict scrutiny, to something intermediate, something in between rational basis and strict scrutiny, so that he could garner a larger number on the court, in this case, a 7-2 decision. The two individuals in dissent, one of which you'll be familiar with, is Justice Rehnquist. Justice Rehnquist is joined by Chief Justice Berger. Both of them argue that this heightened intermediate level of scrutiny standard is simply inappropriate, that the rational basis standard is sufficient, and under that test, this case would survive any sort of judicial scrutiny and be, be constitutional. They, they go on a bit, though. Uh, Rehnquist says that, in fact, the only redeeming feature of the court's opinion, to my mind, is that it apparently signals a retreat from those who joined the plurality opinion in Fontiero from the view that sex is a suspect classification for the purposes of equal protection analysis. So Rehnquist says the only redeeming factor in this case is the, those crazy people stopped thinking that uh, gender-based distinctions should be applied to strict scrutiny. Um, Justice Ginsburg doesn't not get exactly what she wants. She wants what Justice Brennan wants, which is that gender-based distinctions um, should use a strict scrutiny standard. She accepts the compromise. Um, intermediate scrutiny, uh, the important governmental interest and substantially related to that interest are, are, is the standard that's used going forward. To foreshadow what this test looks like going forward, it's hard to say. Consider rational basis and strict scrutiny to be the bookends of a standard. Intermediate scrutiny, as it sounds, is in between those two standards. But you'll see, depending on who writes the decision, that standard can look very much like rational basis, or it can look a lot like strict scrutiny. And because of the liquidity of the area between the rational basis standard and the strict scrutiny standard, uh, intermediate scrutiny has changed over time as the court has gotten either more liberal or more conservative. And that's really the path of which we're going to trace out through the rest of this gender-based distinction standard.